Prior to the Industrial Revolution, most peppered moths were light gray and speckled, being almost invisible when resting on beds of lichen, growing on the trunks of trees, or rocks. Because of their light speckled color, they were virtually invisible when resting on these surfaces. After the advent of the Industrial Revolution, these surfaces became darker due to soot and other contaminants. Soon after, the peppered moth also changed to a dark color. Evolutionists present this as proof for evolution. What they don't tell us is that these darker moths had already existed prior to the Industrial Revolution. They avoid the fact that with cleaner air requirements, these surfaces return to their original lighter color and the peppered moth along with it. As as usual, we saw a survival of the fittest, but no arrival of the fittest. They were just a pre-existing variety of the same kind. Worst of all, the pictures they present to show peppered moths on surfaces are fakes. Peppered moths rarely rest on trees. In fact, only two have ever been witnessed doing so. For the pictures, they had been glued onto the trees by the photographer to fool the public into believing this fraud. So why do these pictures still appear in textbooks? I had to investigate. There is some debate as to when the first black peppered moth was discovered. In 1975, Edmund Briscoe Ford stated in his book, Ecological Genetics, that a specimen had been on display in the Entomology Department collection of the University of Oxford as early as 1811. However, there is no record of this and no specimen available. The first written record of a black peppered moth is from 1864 when Robert S. Edelston published his paper in The Entomologist describing a live specimen he had caught near the center of Manchester, England in 1848. By 1895, 98% of all peppered moths in northern England were the black variety, leading James William Tutt to cite them as a case of natural selection in action in his Natural History of the British Lepidoptera in 1896. Tut proposed the differential bird predation hypothesis as the mechanism of predation. In 1924, John Burden Sanderson Haldane used a simple general selection model to calculate the selective advantage necessary for the recorded natural evolution of peppered moths. Assuming the black variety to have been at 2% in 1848 and at 95% in 1895, he determined that the dark colored form would have had to be 50% more fit than the typical light colored form. This was among the first of Haldane's calculations showing that mathematical models combining natural selection with Mendelian genetics could explain evolution. This was essentially the beginning of population genetics and the modern synthesis of evolutionary theory with genetics. From 1953 to 1956, under the mentorship of Edmund Ford, Bernard Kettlewell conducted an experiment releasing several marked moths into an aviary at Cadbury Nature Reserve in Birmingham, England, marking, releasing, and recapturing them. He found that in this polluted woodland, white moths were preferentially preyed upon. He thus showed that the dark or melanic phenotype was important to the survival of peppered moths in such a habitat. In 1955, he conducted the experiment again with two separate locales, the unpolluted woodlands in Dorset and again in the polluted woods in Birmingham, filming these experiments with Nico Tinbergen. In Birmingham, birds ate 75% of the white moths, but in Dorset, 86% of the dark moths were eaten. This seemed to confirm that the peppered moth was a real-life example of natural selection, but there were some criticisms. In 1968, Theodore David Sargent, professor of zoology at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, published his own critique of Kettlewell's work in the journal Evolutionary Biology. He concluded that it was not possible to reproduce Kettlewell's results, claiming that birds showed no preference of moth on either black or white tree trunks and going so far as to accuse Kettlewell of having trained the birds to choose moths on tree trunks to obtain desired results. In 1998, Michael Majerus updated and expanded on Kettlewell's work by publishing Melanism, Evolution in Action. That same year, biologist Jerry Coyne wrote a review of Majerus's book for the journal Nature. He noted many of the weaknesses in Kettlewell's experiments, notably that only two peppered moths had been found on tree trunks. Since 1966, white moths had increased in numbers, but that the light-colored lichen had not returned until this increase had already begun. And more importantly, Kettlewell's findings of moths choosing matching backgrounds had not been replicated in later experiments. In her 2002 book of Moths and Men, Judith Hooper noted that the cause of the darker pigmentation was still a mystery. Noting that Kettlewell's field notes were missing, she accused him of fraud and even asserted that Edwin Ford had exploited Kettlewell to obtain the desired experimental results. She also made note of the fact that moths appearing in the photographs included were dead and placed on a log. 
Although Majerus himself had published at least 12 instances of moths resting on tree trunks out of his own 47 observations, creationist Jonathan Wells compounded Coyne and Hooper's assertions in his 2000 book, Icons of Evolution, by describing another experiment. Cyril Clark and his colleagues found only one peppered moth naturally perched on a tree trunk. Wells noted that the textbook photographs had been staged. Wells had already conceded that at least six moths had been recorded on tree trunks by Majerus, but he continued publishing this as well as other criticisms. Wildlife photography is based on convention. For this purpose, it is far easier to film two dead moths resting on the same trunk than to wait for the off chance that two separate, differently colored moths would happen to land on the same trunk at the same time as the photographer is there. The photos accompanying the experiments on peppered moths were meant as a visual aid so that the viewer could see for themselves how effective the camouflage is in rendering the moth invisible. They were not presented as evidence for predation by birds. While considering the other criticisms for the most part to be valid, Majerus decided to conduct Kettlewell's experiments again under more scientifically valid conditions to resolve them once and for all. From 2001 to 2007, he carried out multiple experiments and observations in Cambridge. Over half of the 135 moths examined were found on tree branches. 37% were found on tree trunks, and only 12.6% were resting on or under twigs. Because of Hooper's criticisms that birds were not necessarily the selective mechanism, Majerus also conducted an experiment to find out if bats were the main predators. His observations showed that, along with bats, a number of species of bird actually prey on moths, and that differential bird predation was, in fact, a major factor in the decline of the dark variety compared to the light. He concluded that if the rise and fall of the peppered moth is one of the most visually impacting and easily understood examples of Darwinian evolution in action, it should be taught. It provides, after all, the proof of evolution. In January of 2009, Majerus died from a sudden and aggressive bout of mesothelioma. Compiling and completing his work, Lawrence Cook, Bruce Grant, Elix Sakari, and Jim Mallett published it on February 8, 2012 as Selective Bird Predation on the Peppered Moth, the last experiment of Michael Majerus. Involving nearly 5,000 individual specimens over six years, it was the largest study ever done on moth pigmentation and industrialism. Kettlewell's work had been confirmed to a degree that even his former critics conceded. Jerry Coyne wrote, Despite the defensiveness of British evolutionists, I think my criticisms carried some weight, because Cambridge biologist Michael Majerus decided to repeat Kettlewell's experiments, but doing them correctly this time. Quoting directly from the paper, the new data coupled with the weight of previously existing data convincingly show that industrial melanism in the peppered moth is still one of the clearest and most easily understood examples of Darwinian evolution in action. With all of this, however, Judith Hooper's criticism that there was no cause for the pigmentation change was still unanswered. We could see the survival of the fittest, but not the arrival of the fittest. A team led by Ilix Sakari decided to zero in on the darker melanin gene by crossbreeding light and dark moths using genetic markers. After mapping 87 initial genetic differences between the dark and light colored moths, the team continued crossbreeding and noting which sequences in the gene corresponded to the light and dark color. They were eventually able to zero in on one mutation, a 9,000 base pair jumping piece of DNA called a transposon, which had inserted itself into a gene called the cortex gene. Typically, a transposon is harmful, but in this case it gave the moth a dark color. Sakari's team examined the sequences surrounding the transposon and found that there had been very little mixing of the sequence with its neighboring genes, which typically happens over time due to errors in recombination. This was an indicator that the mutation was fairly recent. By determining the rate of mixing in the peppered moth's genome, the team was able to calculate that the mutation had occurred within a 10-year span of time around 1819. Appearing in the June 2, 2016 issue of Nature, this also happened to confirm the findings of a second paper published in the very same issue showing that mutations to the cortex gene are also responsible for dramatic color changes in other moths and butterflies. The peppered moth was initially touted as an example of natural selection. Through subsequent observations and experimentation at the genetic level, it also became an example of random mutation. As even evolutionary scientists offered their criticisms, it became an example of peer review. By with Standing that peer review, the peppered moth is in fact a living example of evolution in action and another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.